Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Meet Aitobas, where my MPE colleague and Aitobas colleague, Violetta, and I will share with you what we have learned uh, in our work in European projects. And we've been actually having quite some discussions, haven't we, Violetta, of what we thought would be useful. So we, you know, we both, especially me, talk a lot. So uh, we thought this time we actually focus on the organizational aspect. So really how to the practical side of things. So not the strategy, we've been talking about that a lot, but rather um, uh, about the, um, like the real, how do you get going about it? I hope that Violetta and uh, Frederick can now um, start, like keep an eye on uh, people joining because I'm sharing now, so uh, I will not note that. And um, first, just like two sentences as promised about the ITOBAS project. Uh, ITOBAS stands for Intelligence Total Body Scanner. It is a Horizon 2020 project, so that belongs to the last funding program of the European Union. And it is um, the intention or the ambition for this project is really to build a concrete product that will help us as um, do, that allows to scan the surface of the body and then over time actually track lesions on them. As you know, we're in melanoma. Uh, detecting melanoma early is one of the one of the most effective ways to improve outcomes, and it's something that, of course, our community is very much concerned about. So we are delighted to be part in this project. And with that, Violetta, I suggest I start the presentation and if my computer lets me. Um, and maybe you want to say a little bit about those projects because ITOBAS is not the first one we're involved in. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bettina, and good morning, everyone. Um, well, we managed in a short period to be partner in several European projects, as you see here on the slide, and each of them reflects the issues that we are um, like uh, preoccupied at the moment and uh, we wanted to to address so just just to say uh, several uh, uh, couple of words about each of them uh, very fast uh, umq uh, focus on um, uval melanoma so actually uh, had the ambitions to to find a cure for uh, uval metastatic melanoma patients and uh, i remember that we were quite um, argumentative to say so about the experimental models and the compost test the compounds tested in the in the project um later we uh, were invited to join share for rare this was a project about uh, uh, rare diseases and we are interested there in pediatric melanoma and i think our biggest achievement there was uh, that uh, we managed to uh, add a research feature to for the patient organization in order uh, for them to collect and use data in their uh, advocacy work. Um, the ITOBOS maybe project. Take, yeah, sorry. maybe I take the one because you started from the bottom. Maybe I take the middle ones. So yes, PCP nice. and prime rows are actually ones where we are not actively as um, involved as MPE, but where I am uh, working um, on the side of my work for the Swedish Cancer Mission, and I'm um, well. We have we are trying with these two projects to find a new form of engaging with the cancer patient community and these projects. And some of you have been already at the workshop that we run in April. So these are a little bit our test, how we can come up with something that doesn't exist yet and how we can engage with consortia without being direct partner in them. And over to Merkaya. Yeah, just just to add that I think I think Primeros and PCM for uh, for EU are brilliant projects because they are going to implement clinical trials for precision medicine across Europe. So um, I'm I'm very impressed with 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 that. Um, Melkaya, well, Melkaya it's about um, uh, pediatric, not pediatric uh, melanoma only, but also about melanoma in adults and uh, in young adults and adolescents, and will address uh, quite. Um, um, a range or, uh, is, uh, of, of issues from uh, early detection to treatments and uh, to the implementation uh, in, uh, in the real life. Okay, so now let's move this. So we, I thought I'd give you a quick 
overview of the different type of European research programs or projects because there is there is more um, than one and these the projects depending on where they sit look slightly different. So this is the overview of Horizon Europe. It's a quite large program as you can see and it is um, split into three pillars. Pillar one, excellence and science. Pillar two, global challenges and European industrial competitiveness and innovative Europe as pillar three. You will have heard about the EU Cancer Mission Board, uh, notably because I was on the first one and couldn't stop talking about it, but also because the calls, so there are now project calls that come out under the EU Cancer Mission and they fall all under pillar two. There are innovation projects that are running under pillar three, like from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. These are often about translation and scaling. And on pillar one, you will find projects that are very much on the research side. So very much early basic research. And this is what is not on this slide are the calls that have been now launched under the under BECCA, so the Beating Cancer Plan, and Euro, Euro, like EU for Health. So these are projects that have a slightly different financing scheme and are very much about implementation. So depending on a project where you have more research or more implementation, or more, uh, there will, for example, be more policy aspects. There will be different type of skills and partners in this project. ITOBOS belongs under like Pillar 2, but in the previous program. Horizon Europe is our current program. Horizon 2020 was the one before. This is just to say that there are uh, quite a range of projects that look quite different. Different. So the roles you can play in these projects are also different. So we thought we really concretely go by how to get started, namely, how do you find project partners? Um, shall I take this slide and you then take the next for your letter? Yes, so this yes, is a very yes. concrete one. You might have been familiar with ECAS, which is the previous European login. So in Europe, we have something like a single point of a single entry point for all our activities at the European level. So you need a login. So you get that login and once you have, it's something like an identification or a passport for any type of EU activities. If you go to this web gate, you can, you will find a profile or you set up a profile where you find all different things. And this is now, uh, this is a screenshot that Violetta did from her own. And you see, for example, you have Share for Rare, you have iTobos, you have Mercaya. So you have the projects and that's highlighted on the left. So you have your proposals. Those are the projects you submitted, but they were not successful or the ones that are still pending. You have contracts, you have your subscriptions. And and something I think is very important because I don't think we make much use of it as patient advocates is what is called my expert area. This is an area where you can add your professional background, your experience, anything you're doing. And uh, I don't think I'm recording now, am I? So um, this is, of course, not so smart. Um, Violetta, can you start the recording? And it's no problem. We're going to do this again afterwards. So, you are recording. I am recording. Okay, good. Perfect. So the expert area, I, it's perfect for you to add your experience. Don't be shy because it is important to add both your professional background and your patient advocacy background because it is often at the interf interface that we are best. What happens in these areas is that we, you know, that this is used, for example, to find experts, to find projects, partner, people can reach out to you. So I think it's worth doing. Violetta, this is yours. Well, looking for um, for partners is, is another task and uh, not really our experience because the researchers are usually coming to us and not the other way around. Uh, probably the active uh, patient organization in research will not need so, so much this, uh, this feature. Um, in, in, uh, on, on the slide, you see here the, the partner search feature. Uh, and here on the on on uh, the right side, on my right side, you will see the uh, search for for calls. So actually, if you type here cancer, um, you will find all the calls addressing uh, this uh, this uh, item, the cancer. Um, to be honest, though, we have never really used this find this uh, partner, and this is yeah. actually <laughs> your letter. <laughs> Uh, well, it's it's a bit funny because while I was searching for um, for how you how you find a partner, a project partner came up from uh, from uh, from Google this marriage proposal thing, and uh, well, um, it's it's nothing uh, is nothing like like finding a project partner is not like a marriage proposal, but certain criteria could could apply. Like uh, for example, knowing a person for a while is helping a lot because. As you know, good relationships are, are built on trust. 
and uh, also uh, you need to show what are your interests uh, out there. Um, and um, for example, for us, uh, um, exhibiting the MPNE publication on our website or making public our uh, conference agenda, it's showing that we have a high interest in science and research. Also be very aware about your partner's constraint and motivation. This is in real life with your own partner, but also in the consortium, because th that could be differences in the cultural differences or constraint, or could be organi organizational differences and constraints, or even financial uh, constraints from the other side. So we had a discussion in preparation of this webinar, so that a lot about it is actually really about relationships and networks, that the finding is actually more about being found. So uh, our recommendation is like, this is just a screenshot. So we have one page where we collect all the publications that our entire network publishes. So that is helpful. And we often get actually contacted via the entry form on our website. So that is, uh, so it is more so making it easy to be found, I think, is what we have learned or would be our recommendation. And now come the organizational aspects. Violetta. So uh, this is quite quite practical. And um, getting the participant uh, participant identification code or PIC is, is essential. So this you do after you got your uh, EU login. And this is the easier part because no proof documents are required at this stage. You will need to declare uh, the legal name, the registration uh, of your organization, the registration country of your organization, VAT number, organization registration number. This is something like a unique code usually provided by the Chamber of Commerce. And if you have a website, it's a, it's a good idea to, to uh, offer it as well. Um, Bettina, please go to the next. So if the peak re registration was the easiest part, <laughs> not the easiest, but the easier part, validation of your organization proved, at least for me, uh, in one of the project to be a struggle. It's very much depending where your organization is, is registered because you will have uh, um, maybe less or more formalities uh, uh, within this step. So you will need to provide everything uh, that validates your organization, registration documents, no older than six months, and uh, be careful about that. So you need new registration documents uh, to appoint a legal entity for you, as a representative for your organization, document to attest that the person that you say uh, our president, vice president, board members are the real person, approval and registration of your organization uh, again. The address for that, you need to prove your address with contra contracts and agri agreement agreements. And the validation of your bank account is not so difficult because you do it online. Um, my experience here is that small organizations sometimes uh, like is, for example, Melanom Romania with small capitals, they will need supplementary guarantees from partners or, or larger organization. Okay, this time I was not asked, but I suspect in some cases uh, could, uh, could, could happen. So there are resources. So there's a link on the bottom. There are resources. You're often your project manager can also help you. Um, so uh, just the our kind of advice would be to allow for sufficient time, because if you do this too close to submission, this is something that can basically become a problem. So this is something to do well ahead of time. Then something, this was more the external and the how to register, something that we have learned um, rather the hard way that made a difference uh, over time was uh, project management. So we, we in our background, so both Violetta and I are scientists, so we are used to documenting scientific projects, but that's very different from running like a project. That's why we just copied a Gantt chart in there. European projects will have um, deliverables and milestones with very like rather hard deadlines um, in there. And if you have especially a small organization and you don't have a large administrative team that can do this for you, this is something to consider, especially as, and I'm sure that's true for you as well. Many of, uh, so we work, we all live in different places. So we don't have an office. We don't see each other. We don't have like a joint computer system. So this took us quite some time. Um, we, um, I'm sure our project 
uh, managers don't agree with us, but we actually think we have gotten quite far. So we're happy that we survived uh, till, till now. But it is something that one has to also put onto one's kind of learning curve. Something that made a real difference, both for project management, but overall management as well, was when we started tracking time. So that's a screenshot from yesterday uh, from, from mine. So we now we started, um, we use this the, a program like, uh, like this, but there are various ones. We have a joint profile for all of us in the same program. At the beginning, we just would note times in an Excel sheet, and that was not a, such a good idea. So now we use an automated one where we have all our projects and all our tasks, and we track our time against the task. Um, took some time to get used to it um, because it's like you know if you've never worked like this that was novel for us um, it has helped it makes reporting much easier because now it's the you export like a report from there but what we find most valuable is that you actually learn how long things truly take because that was a big surprise for us we always think that certain things takes a certain time, but in our experience, things usually take much, much longer. And it is very important, um, very important to, to, to do that. And it's a good exercise to get better at scheduling as well, because once you know how long things really take, you obviously get better at scheduling. So that for us has, has been a real um, game changer. Now, um, these, what comes now, we're more like, these are more Think our reflections that we thought we wanted to share. Maybe Violetta, you want to start? Yeah, I I think what we discovered after the first uh, research project was that being responsible for your own work package on on patient engagement or another uh, topic that is interesting for you, it's it's uh, such a liberation. It's giving you so much freedom to. Uh, just design your own activity in a project from the proposal phase and then to choose the partners whom you consider the best to work during the project. Also, in, in this phase of the proposal, it's a very good idea to read the calls in details and address the ask the requirements of the call. It's something like when you apply for a job, you try to tailor your CV according with the job uh, the job description. So it's a bit uh, a bit like this because this can make a difference between getting the grant or not getting the grant. Bettina. So I already uh, briefly alluded to that, that learning how long things really take and to schedule activities realistically is one of the things that was really, really hard because we are all out of our, as patient organizations, we are out of our old professional context where one has kind of like a common knowledge or you know more about these things, but we are often trying to do something new and that that, that hasn't, um, hasn't been done. We have noted that we, um, that our task involve a lot of communication because we have to reach out to people we go into different networks you have to follow up and this takes a lot of time that we for example at the beginning and underestimated significantly so it is something that i think for us is really important and so now how we work i mean it's very it's very easy to be enthusiastic you read a, an interesting project and you think oh i could be doing this and this and this and this and um, it's very easy to over promise and then under deliver so with time, we have learned really to start putting concrete time and timelines between everything that we promise and then draft a budget based on that. What then often happens is, as you know, patient organizations are often added last and then there is not that much budget left. Then often people will cut even the little bit that was allocated to the patient organization. At that point, you have to be able to go back into your task and your planning and cut accordingly what you promise to deliver. Because what happens otherwise is that you end up with a list of deliverables on a time budget that you cannot finance. And that, for that reason, it's really important to be able to, to, to plan this properly. Then another aspect that we have found is, as you have seen, and that's why we showed it, is that we're involved in different projects. Switching time is a real problem. We all work on different projects simultaneously. And if you have lots of, pro like lots of projects, and especially not with much involvement, the switching time becomes punitive because you, it does take time to think, oh, what did I have to do? You have to find the old conversations again. You have to go into your inbox. You have to start reading. It takes some time to collect yourself. And that time is lost as effective time towards the project. And it is also quite frustrating because you always feel like the, you're, that you're not quite on top of things. 
Also important to know is that European projects come with quite a bit of administration and reporting duties. So you so you're expected to draw to to write um, to write to document what you do, and not just only to document it, but also in a specific form. And these deliverables then have to be submitted. So the amount of administration does not really change, independent of how much you have in the project. So you add a task more here or there, but the overall administration is the same. So this is then the relationship between the work you get to do and the activity that are exciting and the administration you have to do. So this is these two aspects. So think about the proportion of the project versus all your other activities and think about the relationship of administration to real project work. Violetta. Now, we, we thought give yourself time to learn is a good one. Even if you are an experienced player in, uh, in European projects, we, our work very often needs to traverse boundaries and goes across our comfort zones. And it's not only geography here, but uh, such a diverse scientific concept. So, uh, and, and methods, for example, going from uh, clinical trials, which is a quantitative method to qualitative methods, such as ethnography, um, such observation or, or interview. So it's, it's a whole range of, um, and diverse areas of expertise that uh, uh, you should each project uh, learn and, and address. And I think um, we need to be more understanding with ourselves and to give a bit of, of uh, time to, to approach all these new, new fields. And then something that we felt is, and that is a frequent complaint we hear in the patient advocacy community, is that we always kind of on the backhand. So that we are approached and then you kind of get roped into a project because they haven't read the grant, uh, like the grant test properly, and then realize like very close to deadline, they need a patient organization or we were just never on top of their priority list. Then the problem is often that, well, first you're upset because this is just the same old story and it doesn't seem to get much better over time. But then it's a missed opportunity because then you can add something and then you, you're kind of busy with your own frustration and you miss the opportunity. So something that we have found helpful for ourselves is that we kind of start thinking ahead of what would be useful for us to do, us to learn and us to explore. So then we have a little bit something like a wish list of things that would make a difference for our community. And we have a little bit of more detail on the next slide on this. But this is, for example, how we were thinking about impact assessment. So we were kind of had this feeling that we weren't really systematic about thinking about our the impact that our actions had had or the, you know, what happened after we did something. But we didn't have a methodology and you just don't do just vague impact assessment so you need something concrete and this is actually what we're now here is one of our our deliverables in in itobos is to develop methodology for that and ethnography is something that we are now exploring in america for a similar pro like um, um motivation and there it is that we are often the study objects of social researchers. But in a way, we do the same with our communities. We observe what is said on forums and that we make decisions and recommendations based on that. And we are now trying to find a way how we can basically let patients report what matters to them and basically put the, the art, if you want, into the analysis of those reports. So this is something that we are just about to start. Um, so uh, more later, but we think it's important to think about which type of activities uh, you would want to build um, and explore and expand because projects are a good way. Violetta. Yeah, I think that, that, that the ethnography idea came from our, uh, let's say, um, we were a bit fed up to be observed and we wanted to be like zebrafish and we wanted to be the one that are learning about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So what is now coming is uh, what we observe is that our own conference or your own conferences uh, are a great way for interaction. I think we need to use more uh, the conferences and the meeting for that. And um, it's the interaction between researchers, patients and patient advocates and well-organized conferences and the scientific agenda, which is exciting are the perfect occasion to, to balance a bit the position between us and the consortium member and being seen as a colleague in the room and not simply as, as, as the patient or the dumb patient there who knows almost every, anything about, about research. So is uh, just remember to use the conferences to the full extent. And then it's like 
switch off topic, um, every European project comes with a so-called grant agreement. And that is that can be something in the order of a 200 page um, document or even more. Some of the pages are more details about the single partners and registration and like documents attached to it. So that's not so relevant. But something that we have noted is that it is important to very carefully read the grant agreement because other partners um, we have noted are quite happy to include patient engagement or you as a partner in their activities, often without you knowing and without a budget. So you want to make sure that if someone plans you in, you have planned for it, you have scheduled for it, you have budgeted for it, and obviously you agree with, with the proposed activity. Um, so that is something because patient engagement is now supposed to happen everywhere. Some people, especially inexperienced ones, are quite deliberate and you might find yourself with a task list uh, you had been entirely unaware of. And once the grant agreement is signed, you're obliged by and are held by it. So um, I think that is a that is a really, really important way um, to um, or something to take into account. It is particularly important because our part in these projects is usually minor. If you have a large proportion in a grant, it doesn't matter if you have slight things added to your task list. If you're already very tight on timing and budget, this becomes problematic. And now to continue. Yeah, uh, this is uh, something that we thought about. It's this moral responsibility that you feel every time that you go in a, in a new project, a large project, a project that could could make impact. So it's a pressure to make a difference for your uh, for your community. And uh, somehow we, uh, or at least I feel guilty doing something with no immediate and, and um, obvious benefit for, for the community, for, for patients. This is, this is the feeling. And, but now looking to this, uh, if you look to this very popular matrix here, which is called Eisenhower matrix, it's like we are uh, still too much in the area of yellow and uh, green and uh, doing things that are urgent but not always important. So projects, European projects, research projects are on the other hand in the blue square, something that you schedule, something uh, uh, is the area where we do those important things, not urgent today, but important for the future things we always delay under the pressure of the present. So actually we need to start to invest more in the future without being so guilty about what we, what we are doing. Uh, for example, helping today a patient in need is important and urgent is in the, in the square of, uh, uh, in the green square. Uh, but uh, in comparison, uh, for example, with setting a patient involvement uh, model in the research, which is uh, uh, important, maybe not so urgent, but uh, will be very important uh, in order to to set the way of uh, how patients' organization are involved in uh, in research projects in 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 the future. And then maybe to build a little bit on this aspect of guilt that we always feel the pressure and we see the people dying around us and it's just like you can't just look away so at the same time we realized at some point that we were in european projects and everyone was working on stuff they were really excited about and they were really cool and we did stuff we were not excited about and they were definitely not cool because it was just what was expected from us and there was no challenge in us in it for us there was no growth and there was definitely no fun so Something that we now think about is while keeping this mind very much on how do we basically take care of today, but hope build something that will make the tomorrow better, that in there, there has to be something that is also good for us personally. It's just like for us, just like to keep going. We think that is really important. It's also important to engage your community. If we just have this retweet, this kind of thing, that's not helping anyone. That's not engaging that's not where the energy goes so we need things that are meaningful but that are meaningful on multiple levels and that includes the person who has to do the to the work and what then happened is because we kind of through the different projects and the other things we've done we by now have a quite diverse networks of people who are kind of they're not melano in melanoma but they belong to our community and they're not engaged in everything but we know where to go when we have certain questions and they come to us for certain questions 
And that has made an enormous difference in how we think about problems, how we approach them, also what we can get done, uh, whom we can approach in case there is a question or the need or we try to help someone. So I think these, especially these European projects have evolved our thinking of our own community, because I think like many others, we first made a very nice fence around this is melanoma, yes or no. And I think we're kind of now, we have changed that. And I think the audience here is a very valid um, you know, proof of that because we have shared interests and shared needs with other communities. So that is what we found particularly enriching, A, personally, but also in help in terms of getting things done. That is where we saw a difference. Um, and then, and last point that for me, before I hand back to Violetta, is that research is just not for everyone. I mean, we are like, like well, we Violetta and I, we both have research backgrounds. So we are the nerds. We just enjoy this kind of thing. I mean, it is not for everyone. I think, you know, like having a, a weekend with a nice pile of papers, that for me is a very valid reason to spend a weekend. But other people couldn't think of anything worse. And the point is not to the same size that's not fit all. I think it is about finding the people who are passionate about a topic, who are happy to invest the time, who have the energy and who kind of find it meaningful. This is not to go preaching that everyone has to do everything. I think that would be the wrong message. So matching people to what they care about, I think is, is one, what makes a project good or not so good. Violetta. Yeah, and um, just to build on the, the first point about the moral responsibility, I expect to have to explain every time why you invest in areas where the outcome is uncertain or insecure. Indeed, we experience, uh, I experience and we experience at the MPNE conference uh, when first they introduced one of our projects to melanoma patients. And uh, we, we had a family with a new diagnosed child cornering the, the research team and uh, saying, yes, you speak very nice, but what you are going to do for my child? And this parent rightfully um, got it that the present project wasn't in the present project wasn't there to too too much to to help his family so i think people will need the reassurance from our side that they will remain urgent for 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 us and important for research and actually actually it's it's our duty uh, to keep them as a, a high priority while we are busy with with the project and working in a larger larger context so um the last point here is take your community along, take people, uh, patients always, surround yourself with, with patients always. They need to be there in your uh, side in every project to remind everybody that uh, there are patients needs uh, that uh, needs that, that should be fulfilled today um, and that there are urgent. And um, I think with this, uh, we are approaching the closure of our uh, um, of our presentation, I will hand to Bettina. And this is where you can find, I mean, you know where to find us as MPE, but this is uh, where you can find um, the Etobas project on the different social uh, media channels. As we said, this is recorded and uh, this is all will also be shared on the YouTube channel and it will also go on to the uh, MPE learning platform where you'll have all elements together. And with that, we would like to thank you for uh, for being here. <clears throat> and we are now very much looking forward to a discussion. <laughs>